is the same day. Um, this one, I'm very proud of this one, but in a different way. Uh, this, the, the talk I'm about to give is a synthesis talk. It's not a, 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 an empirical study and such. So, and so it's looking across a number of things, and I'll tell you why in a second. But that means that I wanted to mention all the studies that have been, I'm standing on here, partly, partly a, as a kind of a hoping that this impressive list will make me feel more confident. <laughs> But more so that I just have to thank all these people that have done stuff. And the biggest part of this, other than the bold Ingrid Erickson, because she's sitting here, <laughs> is that, I'm a, that uh, if you don't like this, it's nobody else's fault. <laughs> right? Nobody else is responsible. Um, and so I'm going to do uh, uh, three things, really. And this, uh, this piece, at any point and at any time, and hopefully there'll be a lot of time and some interest, but if, it, if I finish and you all get up and leave, then don't worry. Um, but I'm going to, oh, what's happened there? Oh, if you touch the board, I think oh, it will the board is, the board is, yeah. the board is a line. The board is a line. I don't know how to go back, though. So. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I'm going to spend most of my time in the first point uh, with this term that I like a lot, so if you don't like it, that's all right. I have a lot of like for it. Um, I'll spend a little time in the second one because I was trying to situate it in places that other people might know. The third topic we can skip or not, depending on where we are and how interested but I, I, because of the tradition of social informatics and social technical thinking, I wanted to kind of show you how this fit back into my worldview. And that's only, um, um, not abstract, a personal, I guess maybe, uh, intellectually personal. So really much of the talk is the first two. Uh, those of you who know my work also um, probably don't think of me as a theorist, uh, and I'm not opposed to that thinking. <laughs> I've always been a phenomenologist. I'm always interested in phenomena. I've studied work for most of my life. I, I learned in my doctoral studies 20-some years ago that people often study things they're not good at. <laughs> I study work. Um, and so I spent most of my life studying people who do work because I like to see how they take up and use technologies. Um, uh, I usually call them new technologies, but if they're using them, they're not that new because they're being used. And I talked about emerging technology, but exactly when is the computer not an emerging technology? Um, and is the phone emerging? Mm -hmm. Um, and then I just, I'm just, I study technologies at work. I'm very interested in that. I, I, I'm probably not very good at technology. I'm not very good at work. So it's a perfect combination um, for what I want to do. But I've, I've spent 20 years looking at that, and I keep on noticing that nobody uses one thing. Everybody uses more than one thing. And nobody thinks of themselves as a user. They're a worker, or a, a faculty, or a driver, or a pilot, or an, a, a police officer. They're not users, they're people doing things. And so this concept of user bothered me, because they weren't. And um, even the most common, the most typical, the most commodified thing became very deeply, people brought these things into their life, what some people might call domestication. And they, they made use of them in ways that even with the same technology, two different people would use them two different ways. And I was very fascinated by all this stuff, and that even though this was so common, we have no way to really describe it. And so I, I'm not a theorist by nature. I didn't wake up in the morning and said, I want to write great theory. Uh, that, that's very popular in a lot of the social sciences. That's, I think, if you were to do some sort of social science intellectual hierarchy, theorists on top, brute empiricists toward the bottom, um, people who do method, methodologists in the middle maybe, maybe moving up toward the top, I don't know. But I've never thought of myself as doing theory, um, as more trying to understand the world and trying to look into what we know. And so, and so this is a step for me, away from, uh, a step away, trying to understand what I can tell other people about what I've learned, right? So maybe this is a meta description. So a theory as meditating, I don't know. Um, and it's not a theory, that, uh, maybe I'm, uh, I'll use another term, which is I'm theorizing, which is that I don't have a full theory, I don't have boxes and arrows or shapes and relations. I, I have a a concept that I, I'm trying to grapple with, a, a phenomenon that I'm trying to conceptualize. And that's really what I'm working on. And that's um, this concept that I'm going to call a digital assemblage. And so here we get into the meat of the talk. And I, I'm, the word assemblage and the word digital, we can both talk about. Um, if I was a good marketing professor, I would have done some sort of academic focus group and have picked out some sort of um, better term. It, those of you, do you know Tversky and Kahneman's prospect theory? You know, this is the theory of cognitive anchoring and bias. They won a Nobel Prize in economics for this. Prospect theory has nothing to do with prospects. They just sampled their colleagues and said, 
if I called it, uh, you know, did you redo theory, would you, you know, no, but prospect theory got high positives. So they picked a name, they marketed their theory. I wish I had thought about that. Uh, so digital assemblages, uh, I, I give you time to read. All I'm saying is there's a, there's, a reoc there's a reoccurring pattern of things, a collection of stuff, and you see it again and again and again. We're going to play a little game in a second about this. So there's specific things in there. There's at, there, and you can see this pattern. Um, and, it, and it's also about how they're used. You can see common uses, right? And, it, and, it, and it's also from the perspective that I have studied technology is from the people who are doing the work, what I'll call a doer, because I don't want to call them a user, I'm trying to stay away from that word, uh, a, or a consumer of these things, or a worker, or a real estate agent. This is their lives, and they assemble and move these things forward. Let's give a little, uh, let's get rid of a little audience participation. Here we go. Uh, how many of you are, have a smartphone on you right now? Please raise your hand. A yeah, uh, mobile phone of some sort? Yeah, okay. How many of you, how, do you know how many apps you have in that phone? Have you any idea? 100? 50? Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't think I had very many, so I, I, knowing that I'm going to ask this question, I look, I have 90 on a, and, I, and I, you can go into your phone and look at where you use stuff. You know what the number one usage of my phone is? Idle time. The idle time app <laughs> manages all the other things. It's like, so my phone, which I dearly care about, I'm now in this place. Um, <laughs> we'll notice about that. Um, it's, it's 90 apps. Those apps are, I uh, only use seven of them, and the idle time one that I don't use is the most active thing on it. Um, how many of you have a tablet? I see at least one tablet here. Right. Uh, a laptop? Anybody have a laptop? Okay. Tablet? Uh, I mean, desktop. Who's a desktop? Desktop? Couple desktop? More than one desktop? More than one laptop? How many of you use Microsoft Office? How many of you use something other than Microsoft Office? Pages, Google Docs? Anybody use an, uh, um, like an open office? There we go. Who uses a citation manager? Does anybody use Mendeley? Mendeley? EndNote? Anything else? Zotero. Zotero? Papers. Papers? How many of you uh, have uh, a fairly routine use of uh, uh, VPN or library access, and even when you're not on campus? Anybody have different analytics software on your tool? On your, right. What do we have? Deduce. R. R. Deduce. Deduce. That's what it says in fast. That's what it says in And Excel, I'm sure. Atlas TI. Right. Yeah. Atlas TI. Anybody writing code? What do you have? PHP, Python, um, Java. Any of this unusual to all of you? Any, anything here that we've stepped on that none of you understand? Audio recording stuff. Audio recording stuff. Yeah. Yeah. databases. <laughs> how about how many web presences do you have for yourself? How many? Define web presence. Well, I'm, I'm, no, you do, do you does anybody have a LinkedIn presence? Uh, Google Scholar? ResearchGate? Impact story? Oh, come on. Go, go alt-metric. Um, uh, anybody have their own professional web page? Do you have a professional page on Facebook that's, the, that's just your professional presence? No? How about Amazon page? Do you? So I'm getting onto the very edge, right? But, but pretty much we understand what I'm talking about, don't we? How many of you are, um, most of your papers up online? More than one place? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many of you are prepared to be mobile? You have a data plan. Maybe is that tablet on a data plan? You don't have to answer that. Mm -hmm. Is it a Wi-Fi or data plan? You know, Wi-Fi. Wi but most of you have a data plan on your phone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Anybody here plan out their routes so that they know? Do you, does do you, if you're on the train, doesn't the train have Wi-Fi? No. No. Are you kidding? <laughs> well, this is New Jersey, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> this is in England. <laughs> it's nice. Day. No, the, if you're on the West Coast, uh, Amtrak on the West Coast, the one that runs up and down. Excel has it here. Yeah, Excel, but, yeah. but the but the the, the, the commoner. Regular Amtrak has it, okay. but not yeah. the, the commoner's <laughs> Amtrak on the West Coast has it when you run between San Francisco and LA. They don't have New Jersey. They don't need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> it's its own special thing. <laughs> it's important to have pride in this. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate that more than you can. Um, 
I, I will say this. Uh, uh, we were driving on the... Um, my son is a soccer player. We spend way too much time in the car driving to stupid soccer games in stupid places. <laughs> and I was driving near a car that had a Wi-Fi hotspot in it, and we picked up their Wi-Fi in our car and modified our speed of travel <laughs> to, to leak, to steal their Wi-Fi, <laughs> which we were very proud of. And I thought maybe this is, it was a GM car too. I thought maybe this was part of the new GM cars. It was a Cadillac. I thought, I thought maybe that's what they're doing now. So we were driving at much slower than I would normally go, but we had Wi-Fi. <laughs> uh, so that little game I just played with you, um, I'm trying to, most of you have gathered together a set of, of resources, digital resources, digital tools, applications that, that looks remarkably similar in aggregate, but is remarkably personalized in, in, in private. It would be very hard for each of you to use the other persons, but you probably could limp, right? And most of you could probably overcome if any one of them broke down because you have this capacity to move around and figure stuff out. I forgot to ask, Dropbox? <laughs> right. Does the university support Dropbox, or are you all violating university policy about putting material off the uh, institutional site? Don't have to answer that. That's just the research team, that's just the research team at Syracuse University who knows to ask, ask that question when I want to piss somebody off. Um, um, that's what's so cool about this. Each of you has done this. You actually have an understanding that the other people probably have when you say, I'll send that to you. Or, can you get that to me? We, we, we have this knowledge of others, even though we don't know how to quite use them, we know that they're usable. Some of you probably talk about this on and off. What do you do? What do you do? Z why Zotero, not Mendeley? Why both, right? Well, one, one, one of my colleagues works this way. One of my colleagues works. Some of you probably are envious of the person who's got a better setup than you do. Most of you probably are spending time thinking that everybody has a better setup than you do. Right? Some of you don't think that it's. So this concept, this concept of, of this collection is what I'm trying to get at. I'm going to show you mine only to make two points. So you probably can recognize up there the top one is my office. Um, uh, you may notice that there's no laptop on the docking station. The reason I'm showing this is this. The day before I was going to leave to go to Europe, I dropped my laptop. But on the way down, I tried to stop it from falling, so I stuck my leg out, which slammed it into the wall on the way down. So not only did I drop it, I kick dropped it. Uh, that was at noon. I was flying out the next morning, at, you know, that, I'm sorry, I flying out that evening at 540, and I walked into my IT people and said, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and three hours later, the, I was limping along. They had been able to restore everything but one piece of software that I had installed on my own. And I installed that while I was away. Three hours. Um, this is my uh, home office. Uh, I actually have removed my home office because I realized that this was not as good as my traveling situation. So I just made this one redundant, and I have this one. And the other thing I'll point out is, since I did this, I decided that I didn't want to use IBM anymore. I went Mac. It took me two days to make the transition. Right? I was, I'm functional at whatever level of functionality that I can ever attain. Uh, my digital infrastructure is not holding me back, even though I keep moving stuff. So this digital assemblage stuff is, is constantly changing. How many of you are close to the end of your phone contract and are about to upgrade? I just yeah. upgraded. Just did? Yeah. Were you able to be productive fairly quickly? Yeah. Amaz amazing that you're, you're, you're scaling this collection of stuff along and stuff's coming on and off all the time, and it works. It's pretty mundane when I talk about it, but it's also incredibly impressive that it happens and that we all understand it, right? Think of the shared knowledge about how to keep these things running. So when you go down, you usually talk to people. Maybe you talk to Steve, maybe. But you usually <laughs> talk to each other about what do you do? What do you do? How do you do this, right? How many of you have been to a conference and figured out where the Wi-Fi is? And I remember going to the University of Madison, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, when Wi-Fi was first coming in, and they, it was that big um, uh, student center, student union. student union, and they sell beer in the basement. But the Wi-Fi was on the other side of that big hall. And so all the tables and desks had been pulled over to where the Wi-Fi was. And they looked like one of those meerkat things. Everybody's jammed in here like this, you know, doing Wi-Fi. And there's 60% open space. But every once in a while, there'd be some guy walking over with a bunch of <laughs> beer run. But they, you know, I thought, that's cool. Wi-Fi beats beer. 
you know, because they moved to the Wi-Fi side. Here's, here's, let's step back from this kind of cutesy empiricism. Here's what we know. There's structural similarity in these digital assemblages. They uh, are recognizable patterns. I, I, I can describe, as I just did, you, you all carried along with me, there, there's functional equivalence. That is, even though we have different things, we do it slightly differently, we can do about the same stuff with these, even though they look a little different. We, we have this concept of shared access. What holds us together as academics are papers, data, and analysis. So we, we have created ways to get to that kind of stuff, right? Uh, and we've relied on standardization and commodification. Commodification, the ability to buy standardized products on the open market based on price and functionality uh, as a consumer. We've done this so we can swap in and out. We have pulled this stuff together, right? Did, uh, what class did you learn this in? All this stuff? Where did you learn how to do this? What doctoral seminar? Don't you guys have a doctoral seminar on how to be productive? <laughs> or is that part of the new faculty orientation? That's the secret sauce. You're not going to tell me. That's an unfunded mandate. <laughs> it is an unfunded mandate, right. right? Yeah, you can actually say, no, I refuse to do anything that isn't provided to me by the university. Right. When I was at Penn State, they said, Steve, here's your office. I said, there's nothing in it. And they said, yeah, that's what your startup fund is for. I said, well, I don't want that phone. I said, well, you can have two choices. You can pay for our phone or good luck with your cell phone. <laughs> Yeah. Also, not only is it an unfunded mandate, it's an unfunded mandate with a monopoly... I like that. And that's when you bring up the Dropbox. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I learned, that, uh, I learned that I could forward my mail to somebody else's, uh, my voicemail to somebody else's. Uh, there was no cost to forward my mail. So until my secretary, the secretary came out and said, why am I getting all your calls? <laughs> <laughs> Turns out that I can do that. Um, now, if somebody starts doing that here, uh, it's not my <laughs> that's your system, not mine. Um, so, structural similarity, functional equivalence, shared access, or common access. This comes with a standard design. These are attributes of this thing called a digital assemblage. But there's also this use-centered view. This is driven not by some mandate, unfunded or not, <laughs> but by a need to do. You need to do something. So you use these to do that thing. I don't think anybody here has taken a class on, though, though maybe you have, you've not gone to the Apple <coughs> Store or the uh, uh, Android and learned how to use your iPhone or your Samsung. You kind of figured it out. And so probably of those 90 apps on my machine, there's 65 of them. I have no idea what they do. And it's not even worth removing them because it costs me more time to remove them. And they sh keep showing back up. There's NFL Live on my phone. <laughs> and I remove it, and every update it shows back up. I'm like, aha. So obviously Verizon and NFL are, are in it together, and removing is, is more ha hard work than keeping it. I just don't, yeah. Okay. Nobody's in charge. Or maybe better. Oh, do it again. Well, exactly, nobody's in charge. <laughs> <laughs> they can't control that. This screen, screen is in charge. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, everyone has a say in my operation. I don't, I don't control it. I don't govern it. I just kind of hope. So when I'm absolutely convinced, and, and this is recorded, I hope that somebody listens and, and tells me I'm wrong. I'm absolutely convinced that Verizon knows that our phone is up soon in June. So they've been sending more and more updates to my phone to upgrade my operating system, and the performance is dropping like a stone in the air. I, you know, it takes me... And I'm positive there's a piece of software that says drive down performance. Yeah. Right. DDP, drive down performance. And it's in there ruining my phone so that in a month or so I'm like, give me a new phone. Because, you know, the phone I have is adequate except that now it's slow. It wasn't slow a month ago. But what happened? Maybe it's springtime. Maybe it's got allergies. Um, but I, I don't, everybody has a say in my, but I have to keep it together. I have to figure out how to manage this, right? I'm spending time with two teenage boys trying to figure out how much data I need to have on my data plan. That's because I'm using more data because I'm traveling more, and so I sometimes take my phone out and make it a MiFi. I, I, you know, I actually use it as a tether, and so it turns out that's really digitally expensive. <laughs> um, but it's cheaper than other things. Um, there's these expectations that you are doing this because of your job or your role or, your, or, or the goals that you have, right? So the others around you, so this is not just a personal goal, this is an expectation that others have of you. 
You couldn't be an academic or you couldn't be a police officer if you didn't do this, right? I, I uh, as a dean, uh, what, what Howard Wilson mom calls an ass dean, <laughs> a, a, an assistant, I'm an associate dean. You know, as an ass dean, I'm allowed to have a secretary, right? But I don't want anybody touching my calendar because I'm a Google Google calendar person. Like I have three kids at home. One of the kids is living with us. Two are my children. My wife has a Google calendar. I do not want to give my entire calendar life to. I, I don't. So only I control my calendar, which means that I'm not invited to very many meetings. I miss a lot of meetings. I've pissed off dozens of other deans across campus. Um, there's a celebration as I retire from my job and move back to the professorship because Sawyer can never get scheduled for a meeting. It's been the best <laughs> thing. But because I don't share the expectations of being open and collaborative on that, um, it, you know, it's my when my performance review comes up, they're like, Steve, you know, you've got to be able to be more collaborative. I have tons of time between 7 and 8 in the morning. <laughs> Meet any time you want. Um, and this, what I call, by the way, this concept of infrastructural competency, the ability to manage all this, but these characteristics, I think, are what describes this thing called a digital assemblage. Like, and so, uh, anyway, before I touch this thing, let me go here. That will happen. Make that case, right? At least you buy me on that one. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I spent 15 years, I love studying real estate agents. I like studying real estate agents because about 20 years ago they said, when the internet shows up, real estate agents will go away. Uh, that kind of deterministic thinking I love. I'm like, who told those 1.2 million real estate agents to leave? Because it turns out that there's 1.2 million real estate agents now, too. So 15 years, I maybe it's 1.1 million, right? 15 years after the internet was going to remove them, they haven't left. But they're pretty smart. By the way, the buyers and sellers put together these kind of things when they want to do stuff. I like police officers. I've spent 10 years studying police officers. You're about to see a picture of them. Police officers are, you want them to be trained in the same way in every place, right? These are highly trained people. They take chaos and make it understandable. That's what they do, right? They're, here we go. This is pictures. Uh, because we study police officers, many of these pictures are generic because the police officers don't actually have their picture taken. <laughs> Um, but if you can see this, what you might see is that this is a police cruiser. It has right here a uh, tablet, or what they would call a mobile data terminal. It has uh, uh, one phone here. There's another phone right over here, which is the police radio. Three devices. Right. This thing attaches to a bunch of different so software systems, but there's three devices just in the phone. Right. Oh, I'm going to back up again. Uh, here's, this is a small town, like a, uh, I don't know how big New Brunswick is, but uh, uh, if, uh, if you imagine uh, a small town in the center of Pennsylvania, you know, a larger state university, <laughs> and, and you could imagine that that's a police force of about 45 people, just an abstraction. Um, there's nine, nine different screens going there, right? Three people. Did they actually disclose their, their systems and processes to you? Uh, disclose in what way? Were they open with uh, information in your research? Um, would, they, would they actually reveal the kinds of tools yes, that they're using? Yes, absolutely. Oh, totally, absolutely. Really? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we had to go through a lot of, uh, it took, it takes a long time. We, we took six months to build their trust. Yeah. A lot of ride-alongs, a lot of eating at Denny's. <laughs> um, Denny's has a back room where you go and you get a 45% discount for being a public servant. They never gave it to me. And we just got 45%. And I'm like, I'm eating two meals a day at Denny's and I'm charging them to the grant. They're like, Steve, this is not in the grant fund. You know? <laughs> so I'm not paying for Denny's. I can only eat so many Grand Slam breakfasts. Um, <laughs> sort swear to God, it's research. Um, three people, nine screens. Right? Here's the thing is, these are early adopters. These people had years and years of practice to build systems. Why did they do this? Well, because it's how it works. Right? Um, if you were to look at the police officer who's not in the picture, they have three devices on them. They have a radio, and I can talk a long time about the concept of the Motorola radio and the open circuit and the single police officer. Do you know when they go, they have the 10 code, they go 10-6? Everybody waits to hear, because a 10 6 means I'm going up on, on alone to a car pulled over the side of the road. So if it's you pulled over, you're just bummed because you got caught speeding. 
the police officer, about 70% of all the accidents, shootings that police officers had, somebody leaves out of that car and shoots them. And the reason that the circuit is open is everybody else on that circuit is waiting to hear, officer down. Because we drive with only one cop in a car right now. Right. Now, if you drove, go in town, there are probably two police officers. But imagine how scary it is to spend a lot of your time in, in rural counties. It could be 15 or 20 minutes before help comes. Right. If you're shot in an order, or you know, you don't have 15 minutes. Right. So they, so it's a really neat world that these people live in. So they have a police radio. They have a police issued cell phone. And then they have the throwaway phone. The throwaway phone is who they talk to, their snitches and all these people. And they throw that phone away every couple of weeks. Right? They buy it for cash and they throw it away because you can't subpoena that phone. So they may do all this work and then they'll pick up the professional phone and say, hi, this is officer so-and-so and I'd like to come over and visit in a few minutes. But you've done 45 minutes of phone calling to make that official call. That official call is subpoenaable. Right? These cops have figured that out. They're not telecommunications experts. They're just trying to make their day. Most of them, when you say, What's it, what does it make for a good day? What's a good day in a police officer? He goes, I go home unharmed. Right. How many of you frame your day that way? Right? I go home. Yeah. Depends on what you're going to test. I go home unharmed. Right? Seems like this is how it works. This is not a systems view, it's an assemblage view. Right? So let me stop. Um, I've just carried you through a whirlwind of this concept of a digital assemblage. I've given you some characteristics of it. I've tried to convince you with some magic and some, and some parlor tricks about what they look like. Right? Uh, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of your time. I can spend more time, but I also am not going to step back and say many of you may have been inculcated or trained up or educated or, 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 or doctored up on, on this concept of an information system. You know, input, process, output, defined functionality. A digital assemblage does not look like an information system. It is not uh, characterized by a predefined set of functions. It is not designed, developed, or governed by somebody. Right? It does not belong to, to an institution. Right? This is my little cutesy. I'm trying to, uh, here's, here's Steve's talk in a tweet. <laughs> Some tweet thinking, you know? All right. So you have a very specific idea of what you mean by institution, then? Uh, institution is a, a, yeah, that's a good question. An institution to me is something that is uh, formalized, right? So it, it has rules and, and boundaries and ownership. Yeah. So, it, uh, um, well, I'll give you, so the ACES uh, mailing list and membership is an information system, and it's, 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 it's owned by ACES and managed by them. And, and I'm telling you this because I just got my monthly ping for membership, yeah. right? So every time I try to get off of it, I get this long set of emails about why, and then I feel guilty and I, I, I give in. Um, and I'm sure they want to keep count up, right? Um, so I, I, I think of a social institution or formal organization or something like that. But, but I don't think company, just company, because ACES is not just a company, right? Um, I did so one of the things that showed up in a lot of the recent conversation is the move away from an information system, this concept of information infrastructure or digital infrastructure. And I want to say that assemblage is different than that because it's, it's, it's not foundational. It relies, it's needy. An assemblage needs an infrastructure. It's not a total solution. It's a live on top kind of idea. Assemblages need infrastructures, right? It needs systems. Um, a digital assemblage is driven by specific goals. An infrastructure is driven by uh, a lots of goals, right? Um, both of them, this, both of them share this. There's a lot of people involved in deploying them and de developing them, right? So here's my little tweet on this one. An assemblage still is personal, but an infrastructure is communal, right? Even though the most current um, um, discussion about uh, the net neutrality makes it a little less communal. Is you know, insiders and outsiders, but still, an infrastructure is still communal. Um, uh, we have a colleague now working uh, with us, a, a graduate student. She's very interested in personal information management and has got me thinking about the concept of personal information management, which, which essentially is, uh, to me, a, a, a part of what this could be, right? 
but it's not everything. It, this is not. This is probably more similar than I than I had first thought about. Um, but uh, an assemblage is, is more than information. It's also technological. It's a set of norms and arrangements. It's a set of expectations across. So it's not just yours, but it's a, yours in relation to others. Where PIM may not be. I don't know it well enough. Um, so there's a sharing there, but it's more. And, uh, and the sharing in terms of that, generally you don't own your, the information in your personal information space. You're, you, you're living on top of other things. You're grabbing stuff. So I tried this one. Bad. Not as, good a, not as good as tweet. So I got two good tweets, one bad tweet out of this. Uh, I, n knowing that you're s uh, there's a, a number of communication scholars in your school, um, one of the ones that I could have put together was a, a concept of the communication ecology. Right, and ecology is the same principle, there's a collection of things, but it's m much more focused, I think, on communicative activities and often on terms of peer to peer communication. So the eco ecological model of communication, which which is uh, being advanced by more Europeans than Americans at this point, that could be another um, near neighbor concept. But Steve, why isn't what you're talking about an information ecology? It could be. Uh, but I think, so I, I think when you do that, then you have to say there's information, but it's also connected to all these digital devices and other things that I do. So a lot of what these, these um, assemblages do may not be about information, may be communicative. Right. So a lot of what I pointed out with the police officer is there's informational systems there all the time, but a lot of what they do is communication. A lot of it they want it to go away. They want it to be ephemeral, and so so there's information there, but there's more. That's what I'm and and I probably should give a nod to the fact that in the police cruiser and in any of these things, part of your assemblages is non-digital. How many of you have a paper calendar? Yeah. See, um, we do all this stuff in our family with digital calendars, and then. Then every once in a while we translate it all onto a, digital, uh, onto a paper calendar, which is immediately in obsolete. But we pretend like it works for a couple of weeks, and then we do it again. And and one of us, all, you know, some one of us, like my wife, all like, I'm gonna update the calendar. I'm like, why do we do this? Just so we, you know. Whoosh. <laughs> but I think what you're pointing out is that this this concept of a digital assemblage, there's a lot of near neighbors, right? And a lot of the stuff about this ecological thinking, wh what I'm trying to foreground is the work orientation or the do orientation and the collection of devices that you have to pull it all together and the applications that go along with it. Um, I, when I talk to the student about personal information management, she doesn't push those back or away, but they're second to the goal of the informational. Maybe I'm flipped that around, that the informational may be second to my understanding of the of the digital pieces and the ways they work and the applications, right? Um, so uh, I always think this is a really contentious point, but nobody ever takes me on this one, so maybe it's not that contentious. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to elevate is this is not a user-centered view. These people do not conceive of themselves as users. They aren't pursuing their life as a user. They don't talk about this material as being a user. They talk about it as being a real estate agent, or a police officer, or a scientist, or a software developer. They talk about their job, and this, this, they talk about these things in terms of either they can make them work or not, and if they don't make them work, they go away. And they talk about how they learn them. Yeah, go ahead. Well, since you said that nobody is challenging no. this, I thought <laughs> I would. Yeah, thank, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so who is the user then, right? Um, um, because nobody uses the system for the sake of using the system. Right. Um, I feel like, I mean, I understand why, where, where you're coming from, where you, you want to study the use. Um, I study user because uh, from, from the chair of a designer or a developer, I see them as, you know, I do care about the, the environment, the tasks that are working, but my interest is their interaction with that technology. Right. So, so uh, yeah, so and that's exactly what I'm trying to get at, which is when you when you take on the difficult work of designing a system uh, or designing a technology, you have to foreground those things that they touch on that, right? Um, uh, and you have to do that with, with the goal of trying to look out sort of like a fish eye view from those touches and, and things to see how it fits in their bigger world. And so at some point, their bigger world is important to you, but it has to boil down to use, right? Um, and, I, and so I think there's no way to design a system other than that. Right? But when you try to study them in the world, 
there's no way to see them as users because you can't get that fish eye view. I'm not, I don't get the privilege. Uh, it's very hard to slow them down in the context of the work and say, why did you hit that button and not that button? Right? So, so use in the wild, it's hard to see them as users because it's such a small part of the day. As I said, my phone is critical to me. Critical to me. But it's mostly, mostly on idle time. So if you were, if you were at, uh, at Samsung, you're probably spending most of your time trying to make sure the idle time app does a better job. Because it's the most important part of battery in my system. Not me. It's the m biggest user of, you can, of my phone. And I never touch it. Right? And so if uh, a user-centered view is slightly different than a use-centered view, and I don't say that they're, they're uh, oppositional, just that when you think of them as use, I'm looking more at how they bring them together than how they use any individual piece. Mm -hmm. right. uh, yeah? Well, so this raises a couple things. Um, so how do you embrace or distance yourself from a practice orientation and from actor network theory? Ah, two great, great, two great questions. The phone, or the the phone is an actor. Oh, the next slide? Well, the one about the arrows. Yeah. Really, or coming up. All right. Can I hold on? So, um, yeah, if it's coming up, I'll wait. So it's coming up. I know all of the slides. <laughs> I, I share it with her. <laughs> I, I get some audience analysis. It's a slide I know well because it comes from another. Yeah. Okay. And I'm re and I'm going to repackage the slide that I'm very proud of, and you don't have to like it because I like it a lot. Um, but here we go. So, uh, <laughs> so here we go. Uh, what I'm trying to get to is this concept of collective action, and 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 these are principles. If you were to read. A basic text on social dramatic <laughs> or socio-technical. These are the kind of the four things that a socio-technical scholar will worry about. And, and I wanted to do a real quick run through to say I think I touched them all. I'll be maybe not good or bad, but I, you know, here's a here's a self-referential check. Did I stay true to the perspective I take? So I'm really interested in collective action, and I've tried to point out that these digital assemblages are personal, but they're relational. You do them because that's how you work in the world with others. Others expected of you. So this is a, it's personal, but it's a social activity. Um, what I'm trying to point out, and I focus on the technological more, and not on the informational as much, but I pointed out that these are both social, there's norms and expectations, and technological, that you put them together and you figure them out, but you do so in the context of others and you privilege sometimes a more social interaction, but these are there. I try to point out that these provide structures to our life, but that you can, but you can act on them. And I throw out a little teaser question that I always like to throw out, which is, can the particular technology actually act on us and on the world? Do these things act on us? Um, and then I try to account for both change, which is how things evolve over time, and also stability. We still, I mean, if I still could, I would be using WordPerfect. <laughs> I love WordPerfect. Not as much as I like DisplayWrite, but I love WordPerfect. I love being able to do the reveal codes. <laughs> and I was, I'm sure, the second to last person to, to this. I, I, had a, I had an emulator to allow me to run WordPerfect. And the reason I finally moved off is because Microsoft, <laughs> Microsoft stopped providing, stopped providing the transition, the, the uh, decoder so that you couldn't suck in a WordPerfect document into Microsoft Office anymore. So I essentially became isolated from the digital world. <laughs> was that the first word processor you used? DisplayWrite was my first. Oh, okay. Actually, no, Leading Edge Word Processor was my first, if you want to go way back. But I loved it. People like the first one. I lo it was my third, and I loved it, because it had reveal codes. Yeah. Oh, God. So, so you're saying that the, your, your idea here about assemblage is motivated by this, this fundamental issue that comes out of socio-technical? Oh, well, my, 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 my characterization of it is probably reflects my thinking, is what I'm trying to say. And that thinking shows, uh, that, that thinking, and so now to your question, finally. Um, so, so here's the problem, is there's no one socio-technical frame, mm -hmm. right? So when somebody says they're socio-technical, they belong to a tribe, mm -hmm. right? So either you're the kind of the Tavistock, Emory and Trist, you've done human factors, um, or maybe, maybe you're a social constructionist and you've grown up in the Trevor Finch uh, world, or maybe, as you pointed out, maybe you've bought into actor network theory and you like enrollment and all these other French words, um, uh, obligatory passage point, uh, and some that I can't even say very well. 
Um, so maybe that's it. What, what I wanted to focus on is this concept that most of us have read these by now and are essentially trying to understand the, both the fundamentals of them and how they overlap with each other and pull them together. Right? So the assemblage certainly pulls on the French theoretical frames that, 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 um, that, that uh, um, Latour and Cologne used, but they come from Michael Foucault and others who talked about this concept of an assemblage, about a, a relational uh, a, 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 a experience that you have with those around you and other things. And that concept of assemblage, Latour picked up and said, yeah, but we have assemblages with inanimate objects too. Right? We have assemblages with people and experiences. So I noticed that the experience assemblage part goes away, but you know, you could have a diff have you seen the, t the ad on TV about, uh, about the guy that has no strings attached, he doesn't want to, um, and it's had his tie in the, uh, oh, I'll be all of you have had a, a defining experience or two in the past. Right? I, 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 for whatever reason, when I was a young man, I drank a bottle of vinegar. It said apple cider on it when you pulled it out of the refrigerator. The vinegar part didn't quite see. So you need to get like, I have trouble with vinegar. I'll just say that that experience, right? And so that experience frames my approach to many foods because the vinegar thing, right? So I don't know how that's relational but it, as an experience, but it's certainly impactful, right? And so when I'm talking about these assemblages, that relationality is there, that assemblage, but I don't think I'm staying with actor network theory on that. I'm not buying into the decontextualization and other things. Um, I, uh, in terms of the practice, I think that my way of thinking about this, certainly the practice approach would be very, very, very amenable to, to see these kind of things. Um, I would think that uh, the kind of the practice lens looks at how things get enacted. And so you heard the word enactment because I was pulling from that literature. And so what I'm focusing on this is that there's a lot of cool stuff going on here. I can do this. This is what I just said. There's a lot of synthesis going on. And a lot of what's going on in this literature right now, a lot of what's going on with these people who aren't trying to make theory per se, like, oh, I'm going to sit down with my elbow patches and write theory. They're trying to understand the world's problems, like why, why does it work like this? They're trying to understand agency. I think machines have a lot more agency than they did 30 years ago. I think some machines are pretty smart now and they're getting smarter, right? They make mistakes. I, I would want to point out that humans make mistakes too. It turns out that, that ma making mistakes is pretty much not a machine or only thing. Um, there's a lot of change going on. There's a lot of issues. Well, how do you handle change over time? How most of many of our social theories are not good with change over time, or they're not good with specificity. Right? It's a problematic thing. How do you handle multiple forms of technology? We have tended to study single things. One, designers have a very difficult time studying more than one thing because it's so hard to do it. Two, it's very hard conceptually to talk about grand experiences in technology. You don't have good language. So there's a lot going on in this space. And, and it's what I call, back to my picture, but now with a cool super graphic. <laughs> what I'm calling second generation socio-technical theories. Theories that are trying to synthesize these things, trying to grapple with these things. They're not as grand as some of our original theories. They're more, if I can use the Mertonian concept, they're more mid-range partial, exploratory, debatable, right? And, and I, I would think that if you read this list and you know some of them, that's good. If you know all of them, you kind of get out more. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you know none of them, this is a neat space. And, and at the top I put practice theories because that's a series, it's more of an approach as much as a theory at this point, right? how to see the world and how to imagine a, a constructivist approach to building on things, right? But there's a lot going on in here. Um, and then there's some near neighbor, neighbors, and I call them near neighbors because they weren't designed to focus on technology. We just imported the technological concept into them all the time. So they're, it's kind of like you bought a sedan and decided to make it into a, a, a station wagon, so you ripped the trunk off. Um, or you decided to buy a pickup truck and then you realize you had to put people in the back seat and there's two people in the, in the couch shivering, uh, sitting in the back. Um, so so the, the thing to be explained though, I guess, is where you started out. It's at this sort of use space, yeah. the do and work space. Yes, and that's, that's the, the phenomenon. That's the part that you feel hasn't been directly addressed 
by any of this. Well, or, or as well as it could be. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah uh, I don't think I'm the only one, and I think there are people who are doing much better, but that's the thing that I struggled with. And so maybe this is just bad reading and naive thinking. I haven't seen somebody. And so I can tell you that I come into thinking about theory or sorting out concepts. Very, I'd much rather borrow others and make them better than try to come up with And so this, this is really, a, 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 the space here is really, I'm very intrigued by this because these are all tentative. Many of these are very tentative. Because um, people are trying to synthesize and sort this out. But a lot of them are focused on the use side right now. And they tend to be meta-theoretical. Yeah. Or, or super micro. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. not, necess not necessarily the specific empirical claims. Right. That's correct. I think you're dead on. And so the reason I segue from this concept of digital assemblage, then to try to pick out some near neighbor ideas, like it was to help you locate where this might fit, and then step back to try to talk about how this fits into this larger kind of conceptual activity. Um, we could debate all my arrows and. <laughs> I put this up one time, and if you know Mark Ackerman, at the end he goes, Mark goes, Steve, that's good, but you left out the most important thing. I'm like, what part of your work did I leave out, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> and so, oh, that's in now. I got it. <laughs> Mark, 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 Mark. <laughs> Are you referring to uh, the Commons neighbor, the last thing in the neighbor's list? Yeah. You're referring to Shannon Ostrom? No, uh, uh, Eleanor Ostrom and the uh, constant strategy of the commons or shared resources. Um, she grappled with uh, uh, scarce resources, and some of her peers and, and suitors have talked about technology either as a, uh, as a commons or as a scarce resource. Right? Um, and so there's a lot going on there. Uh, Charlie Schweik is the guy that I know the best in this space, who's looked at open source um, uh, software as a commons. So, th so, so that's a repurposing. These are typically repurposed. That's why they're up there, not because they're. Just oh, did it again? <laughs> I'm touchy. Yeah. Yeah, it's touchy. Um, so that's so. What I was trying to show here is that that uh, well, I guess the, again maybe my insecurity of being a theoretician shows up. So I'm trying to stand with others, like you know. But what I'm also trying to show is that most people at this time, it's harder to be camped, right? There are still strong camps in this, but more people are polysynthesis. There's a sort of a second level synthesis going on. Maybe I should call it third generation because I think the Action Network colleagues would say, no, first generation was kind of the traditional social analysis of technology. They're second generation. So maybe this is third generation. I could privilege that. Um, so here's what, where would you put, just because I, I don't see it up there, what the heck, where would you put Winograd and Flores? That's a good question. Um, that's a really good question. In the language action perspective. Yeah. That, that yeah, it's very, so uh, that's a really good question. Because you don't see a linguistic turn at all in my presentation. And, and uh, so the, the kind of Haberlassian approach, the, uh, that stuff hasn't shown up. Possibly because I suck at it, and, and I just. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always a good reason. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I admire that. <laughs> I try to follow that. <laughs> but, but 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 more abstract, but less pragmatic and more abstract. It should probably be up there. I don't know where I would put it. At, 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 and where I tried to frame this was there's this business debate between technological determinism. <laughs> <laughs> I go backwards. I have, to, I have to. I turn it off. I have such power. <laughs> uh, you can see the whole talk again. It goes much better and faster. Um, so I would put him in this, this that whole language action space in here, probably closer to social stuff. And, and in this, I know that social shaping people often use linguistic analysis as a way of explaining what they see. I think that the whole concept of hermeneutic analysis of text. And treating software as text uh, would fit in here in this space. Um, so I could see it fitting in there. Uh, you know, my, the, the point of doing this is when you draw something like this, there's always stuff that you leave out. Um, I was just curious, based yeah. on how, if, what, what, if anything, you've been thinking about it. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's certainly, I'm kind of disappointed I hadn't been thinking about it. <laughs> but so that's a uh, point well taken. And, uh, and I think, and the point that you make, the bigger point you make is that. There's this whole set of traditions in that area that can be brought in and brought to bear on this stuff. And so most of us at this time in our careers 
this time in our uh, level of knowledge, we're synthesizing across these big spaces. We're saying, what you know, what what what, what does one of have to say about this? And, and so the ones related, to, I mean, because they are very much interested in the dual. Yes, the dual. Yeah. Yes, Just and they were very much exactly. You know, uh, you'll see. I believe um, is it up there? Uh, uh, we've had a big discussion in a. In a, in a class on um, just yes two days ago on distributed cognition, right? Ed Hutchins mm -hmm. distributed cognition, uh, which is not a language action, but but his point the point that they're making now in distributed cognition is that many of the cognitive participants are machines and they are interacting, mm -hmm. right? So he looks tends to look he's gotten a lot of federal funding he tends to look at devices like how is the NASA rover crew interacting? Well, it turns out that several of the things that manage NASA's rover are automated systems, they're AI systems that manage, and they interact very nicely with people. They have community like, hey, power's going down, we have to do something. You know, they, they are participants, right? But, the, but they have certain missions and roles, and so if you, if you know that, you have to know those machines, right? And their peculiarities, just like you have to know your coworkers. So I can imagine that showing up in here, too. I could see, as I was listening to you talk and thinking through this a little bit, I could see, I mean, there really some good reasons why you left it out, because <coughs> uh, despite its best efforts, everybody takes it as being about language, right. when it's about communication. Right. You don't need language to communicate, mm -hmm. but it is a very efficient way of doing communication. Right. And and to where you started out today, a lot of your things weren't sim really weren't about sort of heavily linguistically mediated right. things. They're more about coordination in which communication or the it's expression part. use of language played a, a role, or certainly an important role. But right. So I can see where almost the importance, or you know, in a certain sense, I'm just not going to deal with that because it kind of takes me off track of what I'm trying to draw attention to. Is that a plausible? That's very plausible. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a, uh, yeah. Because I've been trying to think through their role in, right. in this space. And the Right. Uh, if I were to think, and I, thinking on my feet is never my skill. I can usually joke a little bit, but um, uh, but I'd also say that the, if I remember the Winograd Forest, they they didn't problematize the conceptualization of technology as much as the the activities around it and through it. And so what I was trying to do was problem. These are things. These are scholars that have really worked to problematize the technology. Um, and so I I might end up putting it up here, not because I don't like it, but because it it's one that's being brought to bear at times and. Uh, and so possibly innately, I tried to foreground the technological in this because I think they're a big player in these games. And, and as a social scientist by training, I was always disturbed that the technological disappeared so much, even though it was so visible in everything I did. Um, and I, I studied technological systems, so the social theories that I would bring to bear don't ever actually ever help me. <laughs> that was a little struggle for me. So, and uh, as a borrower, not a builder, I was always worried about that. Steve, can yeah. I see the Mark Ackerman? Um, <laughs> Absolutely. I was, thinking about, I was thinking about a knowledge management theory that might either fit in here or be a neighbor because it's closely associated with diffusion of innovation. And that is the SECI theory, SECI, by Nanaka and Takeuchi. I don't mm -hmm. know if you're familiar with that, but it, uh, that theory encapsulates the socialization and the externalization and the combination and integration of what we know and how we interact with others to know new things. But now people are starting to apply that to technology because uh, with things like Facebook and you know other social media, we're doing a lot of that. Mm -hmm. you know, externalizing what we know, no, right. combining it with what other people know, right. and then internalizing it to change our own database or knowledge base, whatever you want to call it. So um, I can see it working. Yeah, well. I, I certainly. I, what, what you just taught me is to go and look at that some more. And I, and I think that the point of explaining this and I knowing that because the I have knowledge management and communication theorists in this room at Syracuse, our Carm school has not always oriented itself toward uh, this angle. <laughs> Did I say that nicely? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, <laughs> and and so. Yes. So. Uh, <laughs> So what we've done slowly at Syracuse now is we've begun to hire a few more calm-oriented scholars because I feel like that's a missing space for us. You know, it's, it's, it's visible, you can read about it, but it, it's not enacted, it's at a distance. And things that are distance, it's harder to bring them in. So we're starting to bring in the more 
And so I was very interested in this communication like ecologies um, because of that kind of, it's bringing in a lot of those pieces that I would like to understand better. But I think the point that we're all trying to get to is that this is, because this is a fundamental phenomenon that a lot of us are grappling with in very different ways, communicative, informational, knowledge. Education. There's a, the education, there's a, lot of te there's a lot of thinking going on around this. And, and so part of what I was trying to do with the digital assemblages is, is, is try to figure out how do I explain what I see empirically and then try to explain to others maybe that this could be a useful concept or a way of thinking about what's going on. That's, that's really what I was trying to do. And part of this last picture was to try to locate where, how my cognitive biases, my educational biases were being framed. Right? And also trying to point out, I was trying to straight, stay true to them. <laughs> they're biases, but they're mine, damn it. <laughs> yes? So to your, uh, so, well, okay. Uh, I have been trying to think about uh, these issues, uh, having been versed in sociotechnical systems research and social mathematics over the last five years or so, um, in relation to the education work that I do, mm -hmm. um, and the learning sciences research that I've been conducting. And um, so I just got done uh, finishing up a paper where I talk about the intersection between the digital divide operationalizations that we see um, in the naturalistic cross-sectional research, um, like target eye, uh, mm -hmm. so like these operationalizations where we see um, very technology determinist kind of definitions of what digital literacy is, mm -hmm. where it's tied to this um, constantly evolving uh, sort of set of tools, um, but which requires a constant evolution of the actual definition itself, which is problematic from a research mm -hmm. design perspective. Um, and, and then how we connect that to the design of learning interventions um, to combat the digital, the digital divide. Right. Um, and so I've been thinking about uh, time kind of and evolution and obsolescence and things like this. Um, evolution of technology is some of the work that I'm doing and it's, it's interesting to see how, you know, I don't know, I guess it's, it's related to some of the things that you were talking about. Right. And so you had time as a dimension of your sort of look, to look at how socio-technical systems research has evolved and where we are, we also have the evolution and historicity of, ta of technology itself that's kind of driving things as well. Right. And so I wonder how you think, I mean, I think that comes up in all these theories and the work that's being done, I guess, like time is, time is a time is important variable. So, so there's a lot of research and, organiza and work and, and in organizational studies and in sociology that points out we have a very difficult time dealing with time, right? For, for many of, this, uh, of the traditional tools of social science, uh, the statistical tools, time is a very difficult, very difficult uh, uh, thing to do. So we tem typically have atemporal research. And so temporal research is either panel studies or segmented, so it's hard. The other thing is that, uh, uh, and Claire pointed this out too, when the phenomenon of interest, when the, one of the objects of interest, the technology, is kind of shifting along the way, like, you can't, see, when they talk, there's a joke, of course, when you do a Facebook study, well, which Facebook? It's <laughs> big fans, yeah. Right. Um, and, and when I started studying uh, real estate agents, there weren't cell phones. Like one of the coolest things was to watch the, you know how long it took cell, real estate agents to pick up cell phones? 1997, less than 3%. 1999, 100%. How about that? It, uh, you know, they're like, well, you're gonna go away. No, they're all gonna buy cell phones. <laughs> they didn't go away. They, they did a very nice job and they were very incredibly aggressive cell phone users, right? Um, Remember when you had to pay for minutes? These are 10,000 minute people. Think about that in a month. 10,000 minutes, because they're doing everything on the phone. I, I, I know them, they still have two or three phones, right? Because they just keep separate phone numbers. So they put them all, anyway. Um, so the, the, what I'm trying to point out is that this, this, this phenomenon moves. So Bill Dutton uh, um, has, has this concept of, uh, of um, I don't remember, the, the concept is this, when you get a new tool or new technology, it reimagines, you reimagine how you can do things, right? And so the simple example, of course, is until we had swords, it was hard to imagine a battle that used swords. Like, how did you learn how to use a sword to fight somebody? It's not like it came with an instruction manual, right? But warfare changed dramatically when some group had swords and some group didn't. The, the joke in warfare has been always that we fight net, the next battle with the new technology based on the old plans, right? It turns out that machine guns do a really bad thing to mass groups of people, right? 
it, but we learned to fight for years and years by getting a whole bunch of people together with swords and stuff and kind of. But it's like the opposite of education. We try to fight new battles with old tools. Right. So, <laughs> so that, but the point is that that's so that's the lack of imagination. That's yeah. a bad thing, right? Um, but I think this concept of reimagining what's possible with a tool. Every time you get a tool, you reimagine. Once you have internet access, you reimagine how you think about things. Yeah, right. so this assemblage idea could open that up. I mean, you should have said that it took us as well, like path dependencies. Right. right. So technological configurations don't have to end up where they're at necessarily. Yeah, and what, the, the, the assemblage opens. It's right. like scaffolding that builds up, and then something becomes really apparent what to do, which you never imagined. It's, it's hard to predict that. Right? No, no, but you can describe it. You can describe it. And, right. and I think what you're seeing in the educational world is kids trying to do very different things under old models. Or doing things in privileged contexts that, right. that take like, yeah, yeah. outside of the learning formal right. environment. Right, exactly. So that, I know the informal learning is also uh, very big because it essentially removes learning from the formalized environment and shows that all these things are going on. But the problem with that is that it, yes, it doesn't, it doesn't address the visual device problem. Right. It's a uh, 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 completely separate topic, yeah. perhaps not right now. We have taken on a Congolese refugee in our house for, for a bunch of reasons. So for, for we have created in our own world a first world, third world vision of what education looks like because he's not in a privileged school. And he hasn't imagined education outside of what's been, you know, it's a very different model that he has. Yeah. And so for the very, you know, it, it, we can hear about the stuff and read about the paper, but now like every day we live it like, Oh, no. shit. Uh, you know what? That's not first world, third, third world. That's, that's uh, I mean, that's exactly it's how it's in the U.S. Privilege. Yeah, it's I mean, privilege. And, yeah, it's privilege, less privilege. And, and we, you know, and the, actually his school, John Paul's school, is closer to our house than our son's school, which I thought was fascinating. All about, but, um, yeah, so uh, uh, it's now like 1135, 1140. Uh, I, I could talk all day. I'm all excited. I'm, I'm super excited. I'm delighted to have this um, conversation. Are there, if there's more questions, I'm, I don't want to hold you here because see people need to leave the occasion. So I don't want you to feel like you, you're stuck here. Um, so, I, oh, go ahead. Have more questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I studied classical information language. Ah, aha. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that digital language also looks at um, like paper objects. It um, could, yeah. Yeah. So I'm wondering what's the difference, what's the exact difference between the two. Well, yeah, uh, 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 let me go back there. So I do, uh, um, truth in advertising, I don't know much about personal information management. Uh, we have this student from North Carolina that's working with us. She, uh, she's been very gently not <laughs> telling us what. She's, been, she's, she's used social status as a way of protecting herself right now. Um, so she hasn't given us a lot to read about personal information management. We've given her t stuff <laughs> to read, right? So <laughs> she hasn't fought back well yet. She's great, and, but she's got me thinking about it. Um, and so when I read, the, what little I read about personal information management, they tend to focus on the documents, the artifacts, the structures of data. And what I was trying to say is what I was foregrounding in the digital assemblage is the devices, the software, the purposes. Right? So I probably dis diminished the role of information and documents and knowledge in that because I foregrounded the presence of the technological and the, and the purposes of their use. Um, I would think that there's a high synergy between those two. Uh, imagine again that you picked up some concept and they spend it one way and it's more digital assemblage. It's been another way you're looking at it for personal information management. I don't think you can study personal information management without also being very cognizant of these different devices, these different arrangements, the different data structures, the different purposes. Right? So, so I, I see that as a very good working Potential. How's that? Um, the thing is that I'm working in the house domain, mm -hmm. right? and um, the literature that I found in the house domain is very, very similar to what you know about the digital assemblage. Yeah. So uh, they don't study like the structure of data. Uh, perhaps they haven't gone to that details yet, but the builders of the internet are very like. Yeah. Well, it'd be nice to know what you're reading because I don't think this is a unique. As I said, this is, I don't think this is a unique uh, phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was trying to find out this is a an enduring phenomena that everybody's grappling with it, but the theoretical language and the conceptual language and the way to deal with it is harder to find. And so, if I found a better term, I, I, I would drop it. <laughs> well, no, and this, just for the heck of it, since just listening to this last description, you have an answer here, I could easily see this as kind of a media studies. So mm -hmm. then it's like, why not McCullough and all? Right. And media ecology. Media ecology. You know, I mean, right. 
if you're not like looking at since like you're saying the medium is the messenger in a sense. If, but in the last answer you gave, when you're looking at devices, that's like looking at TVs. Or right. Like, you know. so, and, and so the way I say it this way, which is if I were to orient and try to write to these different communities, I would have to really speed up on the way that that community, medical informatics or, or communication to media studies does that. In the work, an organizational world, I'm probably more oriented. They don't have that language as well described. And so, and so perhaps I'm just taking a phenomenon that is better understood in other places. Um, um, well, and that gets to the convergence of technology in itself, because right. we're talking about technologies that are used in work contexts for very material, pragmatic practices right. that versus communications and informational media, which can be, you know, maybe less directly right. associated. So a, a second thread, a, 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 a thread from this, uh, and again, a thread that Ingrid and I have talked about is, one of the other things was when I began studying work, work happened at work. Right. Mm -hmm. At work, right. wherever at mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah. And now work happens wherever. So these technologies have also deboundaried. And so we talk a lot about they've deboundaried location, they've also deboundaried time. Yeah. Like, you know, uh, I have a very bad day, I can stand a lot. I, I, it turns out that I stand at the kitchen, in the kitchen counter, and I stand at the kitchen counter at the right height, and it works. So my family is swirling around me, and I'm doing email, and my wife will close the lid and say, you can't be at work anymore. Like, I'm not. I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, here's something i got to try out on you, too. Is like, so I did a lot of stuff on decision support systems back in the 90s. Uh -huh. And, okay, now everybody wants to talk about how different the world is now. I, don't know, right. I, I can't help but look. I look at what they were doing back then. All these, every one of the functionalities yeah. is in Facebook. Yeah. That's what Facebook is. It's essentially a hyper-socialized version of decision support systems from that real narrow lens, and so, uh, no, I can't remember where I was going with that, but whatever you said, it made me think, oh, yeah. it's a task thing. Right. A lot like of functional equivalents. sense between there's task and relational thing difference, but so much of what you see now are like task-driven yeah. technologies yeah. originally right. have become part of how we do our social right. And, and, um, and so mm -hmm. the real, you know, the, the thing I would point out, I was going to give a talk here that's really generated toward my college information systems, who studied technology at work and have struggled with that. And I want to point out to them, most when 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 I cut my teeth as a scholar, only big companies could afford technology. Yeah. So all innovations in technology were done in the context of decision support for military or big government or whatever. And and now most of the, the technology has left the building. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the innovations to technology are happening on your phone yeah. with your friends. And, and you know why Dana Boyd studied teenage uses of technology is because that's who the fastest, that was where all the innovation was happening. Not with the gray haired, bow tie wearing guys in offices. We had, we were, you don't study innovation and technology in an office building anymore. And what's interesting is that they are the last group to take on the assemblage, right? Because uh, when, when Facebook came out, almost every company banned it. You blocked it on the desktop. So what did every parent and every family and every 20-something do when they got to the organization? They have a phone, turns out. <laughs> and so they put the phone on the table and they're doing Facebook just next to their machine. And they're multitasking, they're doing cool stuff. And at some point the organization realized, hmm, I gotta let this happen. Right? I've gotta broaden my concept of what a workspace or a workplace looks like. And now they're figuring out how to control it. Yeah. It's that, all yeah. about control. Yeah. Well, uh, organizational theorists would always point out that if you can't control it, it doesn't belong in an organization, yeah. right? So. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to come to this just partly because I want to talk about it later, but it's okay. come up in my own thinking. So um, in the in the famous arrow slide, oh, arrow slide. comes about the, the DSP and DSP workshop that we know about. Um, in the same, so just in this notion of kind of the uh, super, you know, sort of broad social material. Uh -huh. Assembling and ensembling of things, right? right? Just a gentle cut notion of social materiality. So it's just thinking a lot about that when you're talking about this is kind of like, um, and also, and maybe what differentiates my interest from Steve a little bit is I, I'm really interested in those people who are more one-offs or who are not only just uh, working at their kitchen counter, but that they're really they're individuals or they're in small ensembles organizationally as well as kind right. of um, assembling those infrastructures, you know, sort of mm -hmm. visual assemblages kind of based on some of those things, right? So the kind of slightly more nomadic, we have this conversation about nomad um, 
and whether that's an appropriate term, but in, in multiple ways, right? right? So this agential cut notion is kind of if you have like, this is how I'm constructing this assembly, right? And yet there, so I'm, I'm all with you on that, and that might be kind of a stretch on that, but the, the kind of individuated infrastructuring, right? Ooh. Totally not right, but in that sense of the, uh, talk by the way to Lori Gavish about the Sakai, so more to pick up on that. Okay. Um, but the the notion of kind of the individuation in that assembling and ensembling activity, I'm mm -hmm. uh, not a fan of the word ecosystem myself, but I'm with you on that. Um, versus or with or contextualizing these highly collaborative situations, right? So there's this tension of kind of like how I do my work, and yet, and what I thought about is because when you were starting to police stuff, like how much of that is standardized, how many of these things are kind of meso assemblages versus individual assemblages. So I'm just wondering if you had any more to think about later, is why I'm saying this because I'm thinking about it now, but the kind of the social demands of these assemblages versus the agential cut right. of them. A, I think that's a great question in, in the sense that there's this concept in, in, in institutional theory of institutional isomorphism. So in one sense, what you could say is that if you're all police officers, at, per, at some point, you all have about the same stuff. Right. Right. They may have had different flavors. Flavors. Yeah. Right. So that seems less like a personal thing. It's more like an institutional thing that you buy into. Like when you join the military, you get your kit. Right. Mm -hmm. But when you go and watch them in the world of, of, of battle, they really customize heavily. Right. Right. So they all march by looking good, they say. But when they're fighting, when they're doing their job, they customize pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. uh, my observation is that you know, they're by their own, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. My observation is that the police do the same thing. So there's a, a, a layer of personalization. So if we had some sort of uh, uh, it, it personalization, institutionalization scale, I'm making this <laughs> up, um, maybe it's 60% institution right. and 40% personalization. If you talk to a real estate agent, it's 90% personalization and 10% institutionalization. You talk to an academic, that's a good question, right? What, how much is it is provided? You, you, you're the one that has kids and, and SAS, right? Did, uh, it, did you buy that on your own, or did the institution buy that for you? Um, I had an access back to my previous university, and right. I just kind of lost it. It was very open. Right. Mm -hmm. You just hung on, right? Mm -hmm. So you, you, yeah, like my word, good for you. I did that with <laughs> WordPerfect for a long time, it works. Um, so the pushback in a certain sense there is the, uh, like th there's no way that you can describe this at the user level, right? Because the personalization or the infrastructuring or whatever is at the use, at the practice. Right, and that's right. what I'm saying. So it's, it's, it's I'm not a personal scholar, right. right? Exactly. It's, it's it's by definition it's it's a, co a collective activity. Right. right, but it's in the doing. It's, it's in the doing. Like you know, around the future. And, and, and the that's other thing about these assemblages, what I was trying to point out, which is a secondary point, perhaps is that most of us have built these things to be redundant, right? We can get by with pieces coming and going and missing. Uh, organizations don't think of that in the same way, right? Like I, yesterday we, we refinanced our house and we waited for 30, 35 minutes for the system to reboot. <laughs> 35 minutes. We watched, and she showed us, because we were talking, and I'm like, I'm interested in this. So she talked me through the key bank system <laughs> reboot. And I took a picture, it was very fun, you know, I actually, my wife is with me, she's like, You are an ethnographer. <laughs> she just, she went, well, she was disgusted. My wife. So I, I, I was like, why do you care about the spinning key? <laughs> Does it come with the music? It doesn't come with the music. It's quiet. 35 minutes of, but there's all these systems and you could go and see which ones they were, right? Yeah, so uh, uh, I, I think there's a lot of institutionalism there, right? But uh, what I think is this, is this really cool balance of collective versus individual, that, that tension I think is really cool. Right, right. absolutely. That's my point, yeah. And, I, and to your point, I tend to like the ones that are mass. I like the ones that are mass. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's preference. That's why we're good class. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, in relation to the interest comments on that, I think we can maybe talk about um, opponent perspective, which can be maybe part of social materiality, materiality yeah. diagram. So initially, that was developed by Gibson, who is a kind of um, uh, cognitive psychologist. Right. So affordances could be defined as something 
you know, functional and relational aspect of the tool that may provide agency action. Mm -hmm. But it was kind of like well concept, but later it's applied to the work context by a lot of open scholars and management scholars. Right. And actually recently there was new kind of revision of this theory. So someone suggested the concept of individualized affordances, collective affordances, and shared affordances, mm -hmm. actually by Paul Yeah, yeah, yeah. So actually, um, that uh, can maybe uh, something that we can develop more because it's still kind of working place, I guess. Mm -hmm. But individualized affordances is something kind of, uh, you know, distinctive use of the tool by a certain user, maybe a teenager or whatever. But shared affordances is in the work context, maybe employees, when employees perceive some type of affordances depending on their goals and then kind of use it kind of similar way so that it could, you know, enhance their performances. Mm -hmm. And collective affordances is not kind of different from shared affordances. So when different departments are working based on your pool interdependence, not the in, you know, reciprocal independence, right. they may use it's to kind of different way, but on a collective level, it could kind of produce something like a, um, I don't know, maybe conveyor belt or something. So they, they use all the audience in different way, but on a collective level, there's some kind of output mm -hmm. out of there. So that is, that notion is kind of interesting, I think. So I was thinking kind of where we can put that audience approach yeah. in that diagram. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, the thing that that's nice about because I think affordance has kind of a bad name lately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, also the term is kind of misleading. But right? it sounds like. Well, it's overused. Right. Like, well, well, I think it gets misinterpreted. Yeah. 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 I think. I think. It falls where it's too. It gets misinterpreted. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Paul's work kind of treats it. It's sort of still the old adoption diffusion stuff, where he treats it as a feature, of, right. where he teaches it as a feature no, exactly. of the technology, right. where affordance no, is related. Right. It's seeing possibilities in yeah. the situation that right. right. can right. be useful. Right. 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 Right really kludgy internal system that we love mm -hmm. where it, it, it's kind of a passionate love of a, it's a form that we fill out that has numerical and textual activity and so it there's a little kind of algorithm going and out comes out comes a spider diagram one of these Venn diagrams you know which is Here's what the uh, average of, of people that we've hired. Here's where this person ranks, and you get uh, these seven or eight things. And some people steer at that thing, and that makes a whole bunch of sense to them. And everybody else looks at the, all these comments and those counts, and that's what everybody looks at. But collectively, that that thing gives us a, a, a way of sorting out faculty, right? And so we each kind of lean on the different parts of it. But that that tool is an affordance that's collectively ours. And, it's, it, and we all participate in it, and it comes back to us in different ways, and people, but that's a collective affordance, if I understand that right. Not a shared affordance, but a collective one. Which you mentioned, what all this makes you think about it, what potentially a thing that might be missing here is going back, thinking, uh, I'll boil it down to it. You can talk about things as uh, we intentionalities and I intentionality. And it comes out of philosophy of language. Mm -hmm. And so the ability to have a we intentionality then means this sort of mutual understanding of what we're doing. Yeah. And so then all kinds of things that you do, it can be highly variable across the group, but they're still accomplishing something. Right. So like your police officer story about how they were able to think of things that weren't, they weren't instructed to think, but were so obvious to them to do. Right. Uh, one level, and then this last story you told, I mean, they're sort of like, I, you know, what I'm trying to do myself, right, right? and I'm just merely coordinating with others versus what we're doing together. Right. And how the humans and the groups manage this meaning right. process that then, in a wrong and do a good yeah, sense, yeah, yeah. renders some 
communication doesn't happen because of the no, panel. No, no, no. Yeah, right. We yeah, make it work. We make it work. <laughs> 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 and there's something, I think there's yeah. something, uh, there, I get all tingling, there's something fundamental to this point that uh, the concept in my head of assemblages, it's not just mine, it's, it's, it's mine in the context of others. It's, it's a, yeah. a thing that I need to work with others. So it's an I, we kind of, some, some will personalize it more. Yeah. Right. So uh, here's another. There's an like interesting uh, duality that maybe you shouldn't get rid of, though, is right. that on some occasions it's about us doing things right. together, on other occasions about because we, we have things together, I can do things. Yeah, right. yeah. So here's a you, you know what I'm saying? I mean, yeah. I think yeah, that's I kind think of a nice thing to just kind of keep yeah. without uh, yeah. Yeah. not yeah. trying to eradicate yeah. that. I think that's right. And, and here's, here's another piece of insight. We studied distributed uh, scientific collaboration, right? Yeah. So we wanted to look at ground up. How does, how does people collaborate, scientists collaborate? And one of the cool things... Uh, that we're learning that I am unable, un un obviously, to write down in a way that will get the paper accepted. <laughs> <laughs> this is my most highly uh, rejected paper so far. Um, <laughs> 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 it's really good or really bad. Exactly. <laughs> I've chosen <I'm, I'm> <laughs> one way right now. I'm worried. So here's my last ditch effort to make it a really good. So one of the things we noticed is that people have built, most, it, most scholars have built their own way of writing and working. They store, uh, they they, this is from the personal information management. They have a whole way of recording and storing their material and information in a, in a deeply personal way. Uh, file names, file folders. And then they get together often for a temporary collaboration, four months, six months, a year, with people who are also deeply personalized in, their, in the way that they do their... And they come up with what I'm calling, which is the least cost collaboration mechanism. The, or the smallest useful weed, if I could use your term, mm -hmm. right? Which is, I, I will agree to use Google Docs because I can do that, even though I might write chunks and then dump it into the Google Doc, cause, right? Or uh, I will go to Zotero, but I'll just give it to you because I'm not going to learn Zotero, mm -hmm. right? So we come up with these kind of minimalist approaches to collaboration, which harkens back to my lovely studies that I love of software developers and how little they could do. Mm -hmm. uh, they do everything they possibly do to reduce social collaboration because they, they were like yeah. writing code yeah. and they didn't yeah. want to do that other stuff. Right. So they were incredibly efficient socialists, you know, socializers, yeah. but they didn't want to do it. <laughs> and I think this collaboration, this, this we I thing is in there, right? Yeah. Which is, I know we have to be productive, but, but, but I'm less productive when we do that. And uh, someone's already heard part like too in terms of grounding, right? What you just said. Oh. Kind of the theory, you know, because that's the whole idea is that it's it's the least collaborative principle. He has some very similar term to what you just said, where and it comes out of like pragmatics. You know, said and part of the reason we work is because we always do just enough right. to make things work. Right. There's, there's no point in saying everything, right? Because I know if I say just enough, we can first they'll hear me and they'll correct me or they'll say what. Yeah. And then I'll fill in what's needed. Mm -hmm. And so that's a way of being incredibly efficient mm -hmm. and collaborative at the same I mean, under conditions of collaborative right. communication, right. Right. cooperative communication. Yeah. yeah. There's certainly something there. Assemblages, definitely, I can see where you're see right. And the concept of this kind of shared affordance, I can see how that would help, right? Because yeah. the group has to recognize it, right? Mm -hmm. that's Which is the premise. Right. And then you get identity yeah. and identification business going on. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Class. Thank you. Uh, I very much